Greetings to everyone present. My name is Ankit Malhotra. I am the co-founder and president of the Jindal Society of International Law. And today amongst us, we have experts on the studies of relations between countries. These are not lawyers. Uh, this, is a, this is a deviant sort of, sort of a distraction which we've made from our studies of the law, prim primarily based on the relations that countries share with one another in a time that test is, tests this relationship between states and also between persons. After all, states are persons at the end of the day. But before I speak anything else about the speakers and the topic, let me just say a few words about the Jindal Society of International Law, which is a student-led initiative under the aegis of the Center for Study of United Nations under the expert guidance of Professor Dr. Weston Popowski. The society is an initiative to provide a platform to young international law enthusiasts and was launched on the 18th day of November 2020 by the Herbert and Rose Rubin Professor of International Law Professor Jose Enrique Alvarez of New York University, along with the Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Siraj Kumar, Professor Dr. Weston Popowski, and a very dear friend of the University Society and Center, Professor Dr. Mohan Kumar. The spring lecture series of 2022 entitled Colloquium on Challenges to Global Governance and Humanities in the 21st Century offers a compendium of scholarship from the academy and professional experiences from the bar. Over the past year, the Jindal Society of International Law has hosted over 100 renowned speakers from the International Law Commission, International Law Firms, United Nations, the Institute of International Law, the World Bank, the Hague Academy of International Law. Through our previous series, we endeavored to study the different contours of international law through international lawyers, given their vast experience in the field. Given the vast ecosystem and the engagement of international law in it, the society aimed to study the fragmentation and fertilization of various disciplines in this ecosystem and eco chamber. The society as a result has become a quorum of thought provoking discussion for its members. As a result, to the spring lecture series, it is important to understand the law and its differing challenges from broader, different and differing vantage points. Acknowledging international law as a creation of states, it's also important to understand and appreciate the social sciences and humanities that have played a key role in shaping this law. Thus, a broader study becomes crucial. And today, we undertake this study by studying the relationship between India and Germany. To do this, we have three amazing participants, three amazing panelists to talk about their respective works with respect to India and, and Germany. First, we have Ms. Lakshmi Lalita Mohan, who is involved in the promotion of industrial cooperation and bilateral relations, trade, foreign direct investments, joint ventures, and technical collaborations between India and Germany, primarily promoting India as a destination for trade and investments. A role as a head of cooperation of Indian industry in Germany, France, and Europe is also to build strategic partnerships and maintaining relationships with all stakeholders for CIA on behalf of the Indian industry in the EU and Germany. This includes relationships with counterpart organizations and associations within Germany and across the EU. Ms. Mohan has also studied German law and at the University of Münster and University of Bonn in Germany itself. She's trained in multinational law, she's trained in multinational law firms like Linklaters and others. She's also completed an LLM in corporate security compliance. Amongst us, we also have Professor Dr. Shruti Jain, who is an associate professor at the Global Languages Center of Jinnah Global University. She completed her PhD at the Center for German Studies, GNU. In her PhD thesis, she dealt with the Indian reception of Nietzsche. Her areas of interest are literary theory, German literary history, philosophy, and Indo-German cultural encounters. During her PhD studies, she also received a Dowd scholarship to visit the Humboldt University of Berlin from 2007 to 2008. Dr. Jen has since then been working as a teacher for of German as at the Foreign Language Center since 2002. She pursued her teachings at the Max Müller Bowen, Pune, and also at the Goethe Institute Berlin and Munich. She delivered lectures in various Indian universities and published articles in the fields of cultural studies and teaching German as a foreign language. She's also had the difficult task of trying to teach German to me. Amongst us, we also have Professor Dr. Esther Schmidt, 
who is the founding director of the Center for Historic Houses and Teaches Design, History, Heritage Studies in the Interior Design at the Jindal School of Art and Architecture. As a scholar practitioner, her experience in the research, interior design, development, and promotion of historic houses and palaces is key and also vital. In this capacity, she has developed designs for listed buildings, including UNESCO World Heritage Sites and created innovative contemporary uses of historical buildings. Under her leadership, the Center for Historic Houses established in the autumn of 2019 has become a leading institution in the heritage sector and brings together some of the brightest minds in heritage to foster knowledge exchange between owners of historic houses, academics, and experts. In addition, Dr. Schmidt has the vision to underscore the relevance of historic houses by addressing some of the big questions of our times from water to sustainability, poverty alleviation, education, and capacity building with a general social impact on social communities. I am deeply inspired by all these women over here, and I'm and I'm so honored to be in their company. Now I hand over the floor to Ms. Mohan to share her address, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Ankit. Ankit, uh, do we want Professor Jane to start first, or should I? Yes, sorry, that's, that's my fault. Professor Jane, please, yes. Um, so thank you, Ankit. I'm so glad that I'm here and uh, um, to talk on a theme that is indeed a very important topic, uh, especially in in the realm of German studies, and especially in India. When we talk about Indische Germanistik, when we talk about German studies in India, it is really a theme when we talk about the history, I mean, to talk talking about the history of German in India, the intercultural connections, the um, historical entanglements are very important because all of that, whatever we had, if the past actually is reflected in our present as well. So when today <clears throat> anyone decides to take up German, you know, any student, anyone who's here uh, listening to, to me and listen, is here at the discussion and wants to know the reason for no, learning German in India, then it is also important that we uh, deal with this whole topic a bit critically. We engage with it, with its history, and we understand what it all entails. So I'd like to take all of you through a journey, all right? And I would like to take you back to the 18th century. Yes. So the German, Indo-German um, connections are that old, yeah? The 18th century. So what was happening there in the 18th century? Um, now let's look at this triangle. We have Germany, we have France, and we have England, right? Now, by this time, the French had already had their French Revolution and were on the path of industrialization. The English too had established themselves as imperialist powers, rulers. And amidst all this, the Germans were still looking for a grand narrative. It was their search for a grand narrative that pushed them towards the Orient. So that's the first connection, all right? So please keep this in mind. The first connection is the need to, 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 to find a grand narrative, self-identity, a formation of the self-identity. In addition to pursuing studies in Persian and Arabic literature, the study of ancient Indian texts became of paramount importance at this point. And this led to a serious engagement with the language in which these texts were written, Sanskrit. So ancient India had utility for Germans in their political struggle with France during the decades before and after 1800. The German construction of an idyllic ancient India world, Indian world opposed the modern rationality of the French. German romantics looked to India to provide an emotional depth to balance the foreign rhetoric of reason. Now, this cultural reawakening of Europe has been termed as the Oriental Renaissance by Raymond Schwab. So now, if we <clears throat> want to understand the story of Germans, Germany's reception of India in the 18th and the 19th centuries, 
uh, we could basically divide them into two phases broadly, you know, roughly into two phases. The first phase would be a romantic reception full of euphoria. Um, McGetchen has called it Indomania. And the second phase, which was a very critical phase, and which sees a lot of internal resistance to this phenomenon of Indomania within Germany amongst Indologists. Yeah. So these are the two phases. I'm going to talk about this first, the first phase where it was all um, very a euphoric reception of the Sanskrit texts of India, the ancient texts, the Rig Veda, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, Sakuntala. So the first text, actually, um, before, I mean, I'm obviously talking about the German um, um, Indologists here, we have a very important German uh, uh, Indologist of German origin who was not working in Germany, and yet we all know his name here in India, if you are learning German, Max Müller, Friedrich Max Müller. Uh, he was, however, he, he worked, he, he worked in, at the Oxford, um, and he um, translated a lot of work, um, a lot of texts into English, um, but he was not living in Germany at that point in time. He studied in Germany, yes, yeah, so I'm not going to work, I mean, I'm not going to speak about him directly, although his text, India, what can it teach us is a very, very important text. So all of you who, who feel like knowing him better and knowing his um, ideas about India a uh, little better should definitely read that text. Right, so it is uh, basically a series of lectures that he uh, delivered at Cambridge. Um, so now, so the first text was actually then translated by Georg Forster. All right, and this text was none other than Abhigyan Shakuntalam by Kalidas. Right, and twen uh, so two decades after this, we have Friedrich Schlegel who writes über die Sprache und Weisheit der India on the language and wisdom of Indians. And he advocated, advocates the study of Sanskrit, promoting the idea of a strong linguistic connection between German and Sanskrit. A language which he argues was also Muttersprache, mother tongue of Greek and Latin. Now you can see here, German intellectuals we're using this Indian material to argue for their own cultural superiority over the Greek Roman world and its French inheritors. In this way, ancient Indian Sanskrit literature proved useful for German romanticism and nationalism. So not just romanticism, but also nationalism. So these were the two things, so the literary movement, so the, the intellectual movement of romanticism at this point in time and the political nationalism. So both of them would then actually um, <clears throat> gain support from this kind of a decision to make Sanskrit, to, to engage uh, one's own, to engage with the um, with, with, with Indian texts, for example. So German romantics, who were they? Uh, and what was happening there? So what was important for the German romantics? They say, for example, and especially in this, in this play, Abhigyan Shakuntalam, what did they say in this play? They saw the play portraying values. They were advocating for their movement. Both the play and romanticism, they thought exhibited a love of nature, surrender to emotion, exoticism, and religious transcendence. Novalis is another name that you perhaps would come across if you do German studies. Um, if you're already studying, um, Germanistic, then you know what it is. And all those of you, I mean, you should know the word Novalis. Why? One thing that you associate with Novalis is the Blaue Blume, the blue flower, right? Which uh, you see, this is a symbol, that the prominent symbol that we come across in the opening chapter of Heinrich von Ofterdingen, um, 1802. And this motive has been borrowed from the play Shakuntala where the king also makes reference to a blue lotus. Goethe, you all know Goethe, the Goethe Institute has been named after Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, the great thinker, politician, statesman, um, uh, a poet, yeah, dramatist. So he, he also found Indian poetic literature worthy of his highest admiration. And so much so that 
he actually borrowed the idea of Shakuntala, the prologue in the theater, and he puts it, I mean, he, he, he basically also creates a prologue um, in his very, very famous work, Faust. Now, one of the reasons some Germans were ready to appropriate ancient Indian literature was a rediscovery that German was linguistically and thus culturally related to ancient India. Um, Herder was the instigator of the reception of India as the land of the poetic, sublime harmony of all wisdom, right? And Goethe too liked Indian poetry, not because it was exotic, but because he saw it as an element of universality. Goethe wanted to construct a Weltliteratur, world literature, that includes examples from all lands. Right, now, so Indian literature was not only useful for German nationalism, it also found a cultural following in the renegade uh, German philosopher, Arthur Schopenhauer. We all know Schopenhauer, right? I'm sure you know, you've heard the name. So he, he said that in addition to Plato and Kant, um, it was the Indian Upanishads uh, that actually influenced his thoughts. And he was also a great admirer of Buddhism. We all know that today, right? So in his um, text, Die Welt als Wille und Vorstellung, The World as Will and Representation, that was written in 1818, he responded to and echoed Schlegel's call for a renaissance of Sanskrit learning in Germany. So I quote, access to the Vedas opened to us by the Upanishads is in my view, the greatest advantage which the still young century has to show over previous centuries. Since I surmise that the influence of Sanskrit literature will penetrate no less deeply than did the revival of Greek literature in the 15th century. Another very important person here is Wilhelm von Humboldt. He learned Sanskrit himself and wrote, I quote, the pleasure and satisfaction that I have experienced in learning Sanskrit cannot be compared with any other possession or any other joy, of course, except learning Greek. He played a direct role in placing scholars in the first Sanskrit chairs in Russia. He was instrumental in appoint the appointment of Schlegel in Bonn and Franz Bopp in Berlin to the first chairs for the study of Sanskrit in Germany. So there are, you might be already aware of it, today there are 14 universities and institutions where the Sanskrit studies <coughs> um, um, is taught, yeah, and Indology, uh, so just 14 Indology centers today. So this has that, it's that and these, these centers are that old, imagine. So, now Humboldt, one of his favorite texts was, guess which text? It was the Bhagavad Gita. And he wrote, thanks that I had lived long enough to read this work. So this was followed. Now I would say this was sort of say the positives that you saw. People were absolutely enamored by the Indian culture, the Indian traditions, uh, the, the, et cetera. Yeah. But now this was followed by a second phase of criticism of Indian texts and a resistance to Sanskrit studies in Germany. So during the 1820s, Bob's new Sanskrit studies faced resistance for a number of reasons. Principal among them were the perception that his project was tied to Friedrich Kreutzer's comparative mythology. So, so language and mythology. Hmm? In the Symbolik und Mythologie der Alten Völker, Kreuzer wrote about mythology and religion and their increasing rational nature as they migrated from India to Greece. Factors such as the preeminence of classical Greek or Roman philosophy, number one. Number two, Hegel's Eurocentric judgment about Indian material. And number three, the Prussian state's budget limitations played a very important role in this resistance, right? So obviously, the other philologists want, wanted to establish a preeminence of the classical Greek or Roman tradition, right? And in this, obviously, even, even uh, <clears throat> Hegel played a very important role. So let's see what Hegel did. Now, Humboldt, we know he was a, a, a supporter of, of the Sanskrit studies, of the movement, and, uh, and he also then 
praised the Bhagavad Gita and he gave two lectures on the Bhagavad Gita at the Royal Prussian Academy of Sciences in Berlin. And he spoke of the Bhagavad Gita as a worth, work worth of recognition study rich in philosophical ideals, quote unquote. Hmm? A, a study rich in philosophical ideals. So now while Humboldt thought that the Bhagavad Gita div, div, was divinely um, inspired and was sublime, Hegel, on the other hand, dismissed it as saying, ah, tedious, tedious. Um, India, according to Hegel, could only play a role as a childlike phase in the development of the spirit in his teleological system of philosophy. He judged Patanjali's doctrine of yoga as full of wild and superstitious things, strange to us, which are not the least scientific in character. From the 1820s, scientifically oriented Indologists distanced themselves from the excessive claims of Friedrich Schlegel. So contrary to Schlegel, Bob posited that Sanskrit was not the original language of humanity. So they call it the Ursprache, but rather one of the numerous descendants of the Ursprache. And another thing that happened now around the turn of the century and what, what is also referred as the Fadis Siegler, Buddhist ideas were also coming now. So obviously Schopenhauer had already started it up, picked it up, and now, but the popularity, it gains popularity over so many years, slowly, and that starts gaining ground in Germany. Um, Nietzsche, who called himself the Buddha of Europe, believed the struggle in ancient India of the Buddha against the Brahmin guardians of the old Vedic order had its modern parallel in the late 19th century. So we need to realize that by the mid 19th century, the study of ancient India had become a serious academic discipline. So most German Indologists disapproved of the emergence of Buddhism as a religious movement in Germany. So for example, the Leipzig professor Ernst Windisch did not like the way Buddhism disposed of the need for a Judeo-Christian deity. I quote, in Buddhism, there is no all powerful and all merciful God, but instead their rules and exasperating causal nexus in which every action results in an effect and every being beyond death is propelled into a perpetually new existence. End of quote. Windisch was particularly concerned that social democrats, now this has also got a political angle here. Um, Windisch was particularly concerned that social democrats who pose such a threat to the Wilhelm, Wilhelm in conservative society would be able to use Buddhism to further their aims. Windisch argued that the more the culture and learned throw themselves into the arms of Buddhism, the more the inner power of these classes will cede to the masses and the scale will tip deeply in favor of social democracy." End of quote. The term Vergangenheitsbewältigung, that's the topic of today's discussion, means Vergangenheit means past, and bewältigung is to deal with. But it could also be overcoming the past, perhaps, in certain ways. But what kind of past are we talking about? We're talking about basically the negative past. In the German historical context, it is mostly associated with national socialism and the socialist regime of the German Democratic Republic. So, what was exactly negative about the history of Indo-German cultural relations? What was the problem? If you've followed me carefully, there are problems already. I'm sure you will be already be able to uh, pinpoint the problems. Number one, critics today raised the important point about the Indo-Germanic interaction during the time was that the um, Germ German Indological scholars were interested in ancient, not modern Indian languages. So they had been talking about Sanskrit all the time. What about the modern languages that were being spoken in India at that time? So even <clears throat> um, Indologists in the 19th century Germany were almost exclusively focused on the ancient India of the pre-Vedic to classical Sanskrit periods. Muslim or contemporary British ruled India was a source of primary manuscripts, but otherwise of little interest of serious study in itself. Point number two, 
after the German Reich's founding, or the Gründerzeit, as they call it in German, Germany witnessed subsequent decades of economic depression. In the 1890s, this fed into a resent resentment that fueled mass parties. Hmm? Anti-Semitic parties rose to prominence. The use of phil philological evidence by ethnologists to promote racist arguments was a serious concern for many linguists. One of the basic tenets of the narrative of the Indo-German connection was the superior Ar Aryan race. Although Max Müller clarified that the word Aryan be taken in the linguistic sense and be associate, not be associated with the purity of blood and superiority of race, the romantic rhetoric of the late 18th century was repeatedly condemned of having the science of proto-Nazism, swastik and the Hakenkreuz. Although the swastik symbol is not only limited to Hinduism, it was often counted as another point of commonality between ancient Indian texts and Nazism. The fact that Heinrich Himmler carried a copy of the Bhagavad Gita and used to quote from it is also often cited as a reason to condemn not only the text, but also Sanskrit studies. Looking back from the Nazi period, one can find some Sanskrit scholars adhering into the 19th century intellectual currents, such as racism and anti-Semitism that later informed national um, socialism, no doubt. But one cannot make, according to me, sweeping claims about Sanskrit studies being the sole cause for the havoc. We need to look at the individual cases and explore the alternatives to meta narrative of domination. For example, Heinrich Luders, the Berlin Sanskritist and president of the Berlin Academy of Sciences, was anti fascist. So the Nazis forced him to retire early and refused him the customary right of emeritus professors to give public lectures. And Friedrich Weller uh, maintained a low prof profile during the Nazi period low enough to continue with his work during the GDR. So now we can see, I mean, I, I want to put it very simply. We can see that the praise of India began as a self bashing of Germany, so to say. It was the self critique of Europe, the current critiques, the, the, the current conditions at that point in time, the cultural vacuum that they felt they were in, and therefore the, the heightened praise for India. But this eventually turned into a kind of a critique of India itself later on. And so in this way, India kind of became the villain in the process of Germany's struggle for self so identity building. And all this while, India remained fairly ignorant of what was being done with her. It was as late as the 20th century when Indian modern thinkers started to engage in the debate of their own identity. But this engagement too cannot be called an authentic engagement with Germany in its initial phase. It was more like a call for support to the enemy of the enemy. Indians too started reading into the messages of the German thinkers that suited their mission, be it Tilak, be it Sri Aurobindo, be it um, Muhammad Iqbal, Rajwari, be it Binoy Kumar Sarkar. Now, for example, Binoy Kumar Sarkar in his struggle against the proselytizing of Hindus at that point in time, praises Nietzsche, for example, as the Brahmin, the beacon of the Hindus after reading his Antichrist. So do you see where the problem is? Sri Aurobindo also is not willing to accept the positives of Nietzsche, for example, though he reads and, and, and engages with Nietzsche's ideas uh, in, in great depth. He's still not willing to, 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 uh, uh, to, to accept Nietzsche's Superman and he condemns the Superman dismissing him as a Titan. Subhash Chandra Bose, on the other hand, saw hope in Nietzsche's Superman, a hope to arouse the youth of the country to come forward and die for the motherland. But that's not how Nietzsche meant it really. Ambedkar is patient. Surprisingly, he is more patient towards Nietzsche than to the law book of Manu. He's ready to accept the elitism and aristocracy of Nietzsche, but he's not willing to he, he condemns the law book of Manu and considers it to be a greater evil than whatever he thought was Nietzsche was doing. You know, so, but then there were many other events, important events 
and positive ones that were happening on the fringes. Early 20th century is also marked by authentic intellectual bonds between Indians and Germans. Hermann Gundert <coughs> compiled a Malayalam grammar book, the Malayala Bhasha Vyakaranam, 1859. 1914 also marked the beginnings of teaching of German in Mumbai and in Pune by the philologist Pandurang di Gune. 1957, the first Max Müller Bhavan was inaugurated in Kolkata. 1959 in Delhi, 1960 in Madras, as well as in by Bangalore, 1962 in Pune, and 1969 in Bombay. And with the aim of making German language, literature, and culture accessible to Indian students, the Jawaharlal Nehru University opened its Center of German Studies in 1971. There was also a, a lot of rich travel literature that was being produced. Films were being made, Josef Wirsching, made the film Prem Sanyas for the Bombay Talkies in 1925. He also shot some of the most seminal movies like Janma Bhumi, Achut Kanya, Iz Izzat, and Prem Kahani. So Joseph Wirsching was a Jew and he, he obviously fled Germany at this time. And there were a lot of other people, including the German speaking Czech Jew, Walter Kaufmann, who was a musicologist and who gave us the iconic all India radio music, the, the tune. Mm -hmm. And I think my generation and a lot of other people older than me would definitely know this tune. Yeah, it was Walter Kaufmann who gave this music. And then we had, um, so, and coming back to Josef Wishing, why is, why is his work also so important? Because he introduced the elements of German expressionism to Indian cinema through his groundbreaking camera work, unconventional angles, ethereal lighting, and atmospheric compositions. Now, we've also seen the very iconic picture of Rabindranath Tagore and Albert Einstein together. We know that they met, and they met in Berlin. We also know that there is a Rabindranath Tagore Straße in Berlin, right? Um, but we don't know about Rabindranath Tagore. And, and we know that they spoke about, well, there's a lot of articles on that. And they, we know that they spoke about the quantum physics, the relation between quantum physics and universal consciousness, etc. But what we don't know was Rabindranath Tagore's friendship with Paul Gieb and Edith Gieb who were the founders of the Old, Oldenwald Schule, which later became um, christened, christened as the Ecole de Humanité and is situated in Switzerland. So friendships flourished, you know. Martin Kempchen, who is a very, very renowned scholar, uh, uh, Sir Rabindranath Tagore <clears throat> expert, who lives in Shantiniketan for more than 30 years, you know, he wrote a book on the friendship of Hermann Hesse and Kalidas Nag. Um, talk about theater. Kafka and Brecht are known authors. They are names, iconic names, works that have uh, of, of theirs have been either produced. The Brechtian techniques have been imbibed into Indian theater and uh, to produce meaningful experiences and uh, to give the actors this is meaningful experience of, of acting and producing good, meaningful work. We've got Girish Kannad. Kannada's uh, Hayavadana, which was, in, uh, that was that, that's a theater, and it was um, influenced by Thomas Mann's transposed heads, the Vertauschten Köpfe. Um, very late, very recently, we've got Akash Singh Rathor and Rimina uh, Mohapatra telling us what Hegel's India was. So, to 2017, we have a book on Hegel's India. Weber Purandari, and I feel this person has actually really, really kind of, um, you know, contributed meaningfully to this thing because his, the title of the book is Hitler and India, the untold story of his hatred for the country and its people. So often, you know, when I teach and I, I teach students and I ask them, I mean, I've been teaching since what, for a long, I mean, 2022, right? And I've asked, I've had this experience several times where students simply said, well, Hitler, Hitler was a good guy. Hitler was a friend of India. But thank God for this work that it actually kind of breaks this myth. And I think it is a very important book that people should read. All students should read this book. 
to know exactly the grim reality that um, that actually was, you know. Let's not think Subhash Chandra Bose was the friend. I mean, Hitler was a friend of Subhash Chandra Bose. Hitler never helped Subhash Chandra Bose. Um, so this is very important that we know this, right? We've got Arti Barua, who works, whose who's work on Schopenhauer and Indian philosophy is a, an excellent work. Interestingly, even in, in Hindi, you know, we have got a work on Nietzsche, which says Nietzsche Shakti Ka Siddhant by Dr. Vinay. Very recently, a colleague of ours, you know, Anandita Vajpayee, she's um, published, um, she's edited a book called Cordial Cold War, Cultural Actors in India and German Democratic Republic. So imagine there were connections there during the Cold War, India and the German Democratic Rep Republic, focusing on theater, performances, film festivals, newsreels, um, travel literature, radio broadcasting, cartography and arts, art as sites of engagement, um, the chapters, spotlights, uh, the chapters that are there, the spotlight spaces of interaction that emerged in spite of and within the ambits of the Cold War constraints. Very recently, uh, it's uh, Vaibhav Abnave, his project, and, and he's actually, I've invited him over to our university to give a talk as well on Kafka. And he, he has then also made a film on Kafka's work called the, the, the short story, A Report to an Academy. There's so many musical collaborations happening, very authentic collaborations, be it Hermann Lang, there's so many others. And not to forget the German ambassador, Walter J. Lindner. So his, the, 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 the creation that he, the, the, his, his composition of Wind of Change, a lovely composition, which he produced um, and arranged and performed with Indian musicians. So that's the kind of work that is being done. And I think in spite of the dis entanglements and the problems that there are, you know, there are, there is still a lot of reason to look forward to and to work and engage with this, this, this um, theme with German, with learning German and with the culture and the Indo-German connections. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, Professor. I think we, we need to acknowledge the massive contribution you're also making by your uh, extremely, extremely interesting work. And there are two questions, the sort of comments in the chat, chat box as well. Perhaps we can take them up later during the discussion, but uh, I just wanted to share that one, one grew up uh, uh, well, shared, shared, shared with, 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 with at least my former partner, Herman Hess and Siddhartha, and we discussed that as well. And, and something which we've discussed on other occasions is the Grimm brothers. You, you used the word Grimm used it as an adjective, but I'll be very interested if you can speak about the Grimm brothers and how um, these tales really inspired. And our mother used to read these, and of course, the Arabian Nights. So there you go. That's how, that's how global our our, our, our sleeping routines also used to be, and, and and the reading vocabulary increased manyfold since since then. Uh, so, so one was deeply inspired by the literature which which was introduced to us at a very early age. Now I, I invite our next speaker, and um, uh, the you can speak for 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 around 20, 25 minutes. Then we can we can have a, a final speaker. Thanks a lot, <laughs> Ankit. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm so honored um, and also very pleased to be part of this very distinguished panel. Um, I am a German business lawyer and I have an LLM in corporate security and compliance. Um, as Ankit mentioned, um, I had the Confederation of Indian Industry uh, for Germany and France. Um, and uh, for those who don't know CII, um, CII is India's Apex Industry Association. Um, last year we celebrated our 125th birthday. Um, so many of India's important sectoral associations also come under CII. And so we have an indirect membership of over 300,000 enterprises in India. We have 67 offices, so we represent in all the major Indian cities, and we have 12 overseas offices, uh, basically to um, help our member companies in India connect worldwide. Um, CII is the voice of Indian industry in India and abroad. 
Um, apart from uh, working for CII, I've also um, co-founded a health tech company, um, OncoCoin AG, which is using AI and blockchain for new drug discovery. So in 2020, um, we actually launched the largest um, cancer patient app community. And today we have, I mean, close to 600,000 cancer patients in our ecosystem. And our app provides information to cancer patients and their loved ones free of cost because there is uh, a lot of, you know, um, questions that a patient has, and we answer those fundamental questions, but also offer services in our ecosystem for cancer patients. Um, thank you so much, Anket, President of General Society uh, of International Law for inviting us to this panel. And I am also so honored that I can meet both the professors here in this panel. And I think in the run up of, uh, to this year's Indo-German intergovernmental consultations, um, it's very timely that uh, you know your prestigious university is organizing this very important session. Um, I'm sure the series uh, will highlight, um, discuss, and draw up you know an action plan for a new and forward-looking uh, path for an enlarged um, Indo-German partnership. I don't want to go much into the history because I'm not an expert, and uh, we have two experts here. But you may be aware that last year, uh, Germany and India celebrated 70 years of diplomatic relations. Um, meaningful ties um, between India and Germany for a shared future. Um, this is how the you know, freshly appointed German ambassador then in New Delhi described his expectations in his first report to the uh, Federal Foreign Office, the Auswärtige Amt, which was at that time not in Berlin, but in Bonn, because Bonn was the capital city of Germany. Um, and uh, our two you know, young republics had then um, established diplomatic relations on 7th March, 1951. So in two days, it's um, 71 years ago. And um, today, these expectations um, that the German ambassador had have become reality. Um, Germany and India are strategic partners. Uh, we are torchbearers of shared democratic values and are contributing immensely uh, with our human capital to build a more connected, a more digital and a more equitable tomorrow. Um, we also champion a rule-based global order, both within the United Nations and as partners in the Alliance for Multilateralism. Today in 2022, apart from uh, deepening uh, you know, bilateral trade relations, emphasis is also being laid on a stronger cooperation in the areas of climate change, environment protection. Uh, our German ambassador, Walter Lindner, mentioned that just two weeks ago, renewable energy, uh, digitalization, education, skills development, research, science and technology. Um, the governments of India and Germany in uh, close cooperation with Indian and German industry uh, through CII, uh, the association I represent, and our counterpart BDI, uh, Bundesverband der Deutschen Industrie, uh, is translated as Federation of German Industries, we have formed an advisory group to build a strategic partnership in key areas like Industry 4.0. And this was also mentioned in the joint statement um, that was released after Dr. Angela Merkel, our former chancellor, visited New Delhi um, for the intergovernmental consultations on 1st of November, 2019. Um, you may wonder why does Industry 4.0 make uh, for an excellent platform for industrial collaboration between India and Germany? Well, the answers lie in economic as well as social uh, factors, because both the countries have strengths and weakness. So um, strategic collaboration using the principles of Industry 4.0 can actually help both India and Germany uh, increase their industrial output, GDP, and also make optimal use of human resources. Um, so as a global heavyweight in manufacturing and machine export, um, Germany has this leading position in the um, development and 
uh, deployment of Industry 4.0 concepts and technology. Um, but the problem is that its IT sector, uh, formed by a labor force of approximately 800,000 employees, that's just not enough. It needs much more, you know, uh, professionals to reach its full potential. And India, on the other hand, is a global leader in IT and a business, a business process outsourcing, but its manufacturing industry needs to grow significantly and compete globally. Um, these realities clearly show the need for a industry 4.0 based collaboration between both the countries. So the Indo-German Digital Experts Group um, now due to the pandemic meets regularly online. Otherwise we wouldn't you know, have those meetings in Berlin. And um, we identify areas for mutual cooperation and give recommendations to both the Indian and the German, German government uh, for future policy initiatives to be jointly considered by both sides. And this would also include, you know, a dialogue on standardization, because as you know, standards provide a common language for trade. Um, they play a very crucial role in steering the development of innovation and new technologies. And they also help um, in ensuring that the process of digital transformation is successful for all. Um, so they play a very crucial role in economic recovery, which is very important for the growth uh, post the pandemic. Um, I will also say a few words about the free trade agreement. Um, so the other important point I would like to touch upon is the um, India EU FDA. And um, you may know that it was stalled for many years in the past, so since 2012. And then suddenly in 2021, um, in Portugal, India and the European Union decided to restart the long stalled uh, talks for a very comprehensive trade and investment treaty. Um, the background why it was stalled for many years, um, we believe is that India's economic growth really took off after it opened itself you know, to international investments in the 1990s. Um, but the forces of globalization not only in India, but everywhere, have also deepened uh, the inequality and left some you know, local manufacturers vulnerable in the face of cheaper imports from abroad. So FTAs are clearly a, a very important element uh, of global trade, but you have to guard against lowering tariffs too much um, you know, for the import of foreign products. So the fear of India was that um, you can get flooded by foreign goods and that of course hurts the domestic industry. Um, but the data shows that avoiding free trade deals has not necessarily made Indian manufacturers more competitive. Um, from the German point of view, um, and this is also mentioned in, um, you know, the Bundesregierung website, an FTA between the EU and India can actually help eliminate existing barriers to trade and give a fresh, um, you know, push uh, to our bilateral cooperation. India's population is the second largest in the world, um, making the country a very important trading partner for German businesses. So both the German federal government and the European Commission insist that, you know, any agreement with India must be comprehensive and ambitious. Um, recently, our Union Commerce Minister Piyush Goyal also said that India is, you know, not just looking at signing FTAs just to join a group, but instead India is looking at um, reciprocal access, good market conditions, and a fair play in trade of both goods and services. Um, and according to the minister, India is looking at FTAs with nations which have uh, values of democracy, uh, transparency, and mutual growth. And um, needless to say that Germany clearly fulfills those points. So now India is gearing up to finalize FTAs with the UK, Australia, EU, Canada, and other major economies. And um, the recent economic survey highlighted that India's need for FTAs, there is a need for FTAs in India because it'll help diversify exports and explore new shores for promotion of its product. Um, it's also observed that approximately 40% of India's exports is limited to just four, uh, you know, seven countries. 
And you know, this indicates that India needs to do a lot more uh, on widening its export basket um, and give a further push to promoting exports to new shores. Now, how does Germany view India? I can of course give my, you know, uh, personal point of view because I've spent a you know, large part of my life uh, in Germany. Um, we left India when I was seven years old. So I moved to, uh, my dad was posted to the UNIDO office. He was India's representative to UNIDO uh, in, in Switzerland for two years. So I started school in Switzerland and then we moved to Germany. So I also have a lot of personal perceptions that I could share, but uh, I'll start with uh, what the G German government did. So last year, the um, Auswärtige Amt, uh, the Federal Foreign Office in Berlin published its um, first foreign policy guidelines on the Indo-Pacific region. Um, these new guidelines represent a commitment to even closer dialogue with India and the region uh, you know, in the future. So the background to this is that after the COVID-19 pandemic started, Germany realized um, that it's, you know, the economy is heavily dependent on China and there were a lot of supply chain disruptions and so on. So uh, these guidelines came, you know, just to um, present that Germany has to also look at other countries in Asia and India is a huge uh, market. Um, Germany recognizes that India is an economically rising power. Uh, it's not only the world's largest democracy, and fourth largest military power, but India is now producing a striking uh, amount of top talents um, that are leading uh, innovative tech giants, um, but also you know, numerous unicorns you see each year in India with a market valuation of over one, 1 billion US dollars. Uh, it's impressive that you know, 30% of CEOs of Fortune 500 companies are of Indian origin. So you have the CEOs of IBM, Alphabet, Google, Chanel, um, Twitter, Microsoft, Mastercard, Nokia, just to name a few um, who are Indian. Uh, India is also training a record number of scientists and engineers, not only for itself, but also for the Western world, um, especially in you know, United States. Um, my prediction is that this will also soon be the case in Europe and in Germany. So we are extremely proud that we have an Indian CEO for Deutsche Telekom, Mr. Srini Gopalan. I feel so proud about that because um, when we moved to Germany in 1995, you could have never imagined that Deutsche Telekom would one day have an Indian CEO because there weren't many Indians here. And I think in the times to come, we'll have more Indians and more Indian CEOs in German companies. Um, Germany is looking now more than ever to partner with India um, and um, even in the past, uh, in your previous presentation, uh, Professor Jane, you mentioned that um, German scholars have had a very special affinity to Sanskrit, uh, Indian mythology, literature and philosophy. It was interesting to read in some of the German newspapers uh, that you know Germans could even be the custodians of Sanskrit in, in the future because the um, demand for Sanskrit and Indology courses in Germany um, is very high. So uh, we already heard in, in Professor James' um, presentation and speech that there are 14 universities in Germany who teach, uh, that teach Sanskrit and compared to UK, they just have four. Um, now let me talk about the Indian footprint in Germany. Um, today you have approximately 25,000 students every year that come to Germany um, to, do, to do their higher studies. And um, even if you look at the um, development of immigration from India, you see a dynamic increase in recent years. So between 2010 and 2020, um, the number of um, people with Indian origin, uh, I mean, citizenship in Germany rose from um, 48,000 to 151,000. Um, so the share of the total foreign population increased from 0.7% to 1.6%. There was this interesting study that was conducted lately 
in some institute in Cologne, I, I forget the name, I'm sorry, that Indians in Germany on an average have higher incomes than the German average. And thus Indians are making a positive contribution to the German economy and society. The footprint in Germany is um, growing in terms of students, exchange programs, um, academic partnerships and industry linkages. Um, CII together with Ernst Young and um, the Bertelsmann Stiftung, we did a study um, on Indian investments in Germany and according to our study, as many as, as many as 74 of the top Indian companies have generated annual revenues of 11 billion euros and employ nearly 24,000 people in Germany and this number continues to grow. Um, since I'm speaking to, you know, law students today, I would also like to mention the um, German supply chain law. So uh, it's translated as Gesetz über die unternehmerischen Sorgfaltspflichten in Lieferketten, Lieferkettengesetz, kurz gesagt, which has been passed by the parliament on um, 11th June 2021. And it will enter into force on 1st of January 2023. And it applies to companies, um, regardless uh, you know, of their legal form, that have their head office, uh, principal uh, place of business, or registered office in Germany and have more than 3,000 employees. So what is it about? So basically, the companies are held responsible for every step of the way from the raw materials to the finished products. So this law aims to protect workers from exploitation across supply chains and aims to protect human rights across the world. So in future, it'll be very clear, um, it'll be very clear that, you know, made in Germany also means respect uh, for human rights. Um, the government draft of this law states in an explanatory section that due to their strong integration into global sales, and procure, uh, procurement markets, German companies are particularly confronted with human rights challenges in their supply chains. So um, from the German point of view, the highest risks in India can be seen in non-compliance with the existing labor and environmental laws, topics that are often being named with respect to supply chain risks in India are child labor or unequal treatment of employees. Though it should be noted that those risks are not really risks because we have the laws in India. Uh, if the companies adhere to the Indian laws, those are not risks. Um, but yeah, uh, German companies dealing with uh, you know, India have to be careful in, in this regard. Um, making sure to be compliant with human rights and environmental sustainability are topics which need to be addressed in every single sector. So uh, no industry should see themselves as being in a safe harbor, but especially industries with harsh working conditions, like for example, you would have in the construction industry or textile industry or chemical industry, um, you know, they should be alert and take the necessary actions to avoid being non-compliant with the respective laws. Um, sanctions for non-compliance with the due diligence, um, you know, Fines range from 100,000 to 800,000 euros, up to 400 million euros. Um, yeah, so companies can face, uh, you know, face fines up to 2% uh, of the average annual turnover. Um, now I will say a few words about the skills and what we're doing in that area, um, the collaborations in, uh, we have in, in the area of skills development. So one of India's uh, biggest challenge as well as advantage is its um, growing young population. Um, we have an impressive number of 12 million who are entering the workforce um, every year in India. So they need to be educated and skilled to get productive and you know, get decent jobs to improve their livelihood. And Germany is one of you know, the strong partners um, in skilling Indian youth. Germany has already made huge uh, contributions in terms of skilling, um, you know, Indians uh, with companies like Bosch, Siemens, Mercedes-Benz that have immensely contributed to our national uh, skills India program with the, you know, training centers uh, that they have built in India. 
It's also important to note that the third um, Indian Institute of Technology in Madras was actually set up in 1959 after the Federal Republic of Germany, that was West Germany, then offered assistance to set up the institute during the um, Prime Minister Nehru's visit to the country in 1956. Um, Germany can be, you know, credited for shaping the Western uni university system. Um, education in Germany is practically, I would say, free of cost. So the fees that you pay um, are more administrative fees and just 500 euros per semester. It must have increased by now. I have to check it again. But when I was studying, it was 500 uh, euros per semester. And um, this, of course, this education model is is attracting so many students, foreign students um, from all over the world to, you know, uh, complete their higher studies here. Um, the industry associate, association that I represent, CII, um, our, you know, association with Germany actually goes back to 30 years. So in 1995, we opened our first country office and um, during that time, CII established and concluded partnerships between CII and several German universities, um, uh, yeah, like Steinbeis, uh, Fraunhofer, um, the RWTH Aachen, and it was CII um, that initiated the first postgraduate master's program in production engineering for Indian students in English language in the universities of Aachen then, um, and also in Heidelberg. Um, I already mentioned how many students are coming in, and it's uh, interesting that the federal um, education minister, um, you know, recently uh, mentioned that we actually need many more students, um, especially from countries like India, coming into Germany, because Germany needs to recruit 400,000 skilled workers from abroad to you know, not only address the demographic imbalance that we have in Germany, but also the labor shortage in key sectors. Um, so Germany is also looking at India, you know, Indians um, to come into the country and um, um, fill the gap that we have here currently. Um, I have to be very honest and transparent. There are hurdles that Indians face in Germany. So, some of them, I mean, there are quite a few, but just to mention the important ones. So when, when for example, someone comes with a um, spouse dependent visa to Germany, um, the wife or the husband wouldn't automatically have a work permit. Um, and that's not attractive because you would have then the spouse, you know, say staying at home and, um, not being able to work. So this is something we're trying to push from CII um, because of course we speak to the Indian diaspora here. We're also speaking to the Indian companies and this is one of the issues that Indians and Indian companies face uh, when they send uh, you know, workers to Germany. Um, the other thing is um, marriage. So when two Indian passport holders want to get married, um, in the German Standesamt, it's not possible, or it's possible only after a lot of paperwork because Indian uh, documents are not trusted by German authorities. So you need to get a certificate that you're not already married in India um, and things like that. So which makes it very difficult to get married in Germany if you have an Indian passport. Um, also the recognition of international degrees um, for doctors, not for all the uh, you know professions, but for doctors, lawyers, it's very difficult to get their uh, degrees recognized here. So someone who studied law in India cannot become a lawyer in Germany. Indian doctors cannot automatically work in Germany. So there are some hurdles there. Um, I would like to end my statement by mentioning that CII, um, together with the Frankfurt School of Finance and Management, um, we have launched the first ever Indo-German Center for Business Excellence, which is a um, registered association under German law with a nonprofit tax status. And we aim to unite students, um, corporates, and organizations uh, with interest in business relations between India and Germany. And we would be extremely pleased um, to have 
you know, your society actively participate in our India Center. We can have that discussion offline. So I believe, you know, there is immense potential in terms of collaboration between Germany and India, and I look forward to the further discussion. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lakshmi. We, we echo your sentiment completely and, and, and also would like to join hands on, on other important personal initiatives which you have undertaken, especially with respect to cancer. And you know, on personal occasions, I've mul on multiple times, I've shared with you and admired the initiative which you undertaken, which is, which, is, which is extremely important. It reminds me of it reminds me of Shamat Patidapaya, who used to work for Facebook and now has started social work. And, and he deals with real life issues like the ones which you're, which you're dealing with, which is extremely, extremely important and, and a remarkable, remarkable undertaking. I mean, the society, the center and the university at large will be more than happy to, to, to work with, with you and collaborate with you on, on, on these initiatives and, and others as well. Um, the other enterprise, the initiative, which, which is which is deeply inspiring to me, is is Professor Professor Schmidt's work, and uh, uh, I now invite her to to share her presentation with us. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It was fascinating to hear the other speakers, and um, I'm also really impressed, Ankit, with, with what you are doing. You really have a fantastic entrepreneurial spirit, and it's so nice to have a young student, you know, do all of these initiatives, and you've really organized fantastic talks in the past, and um, so thank you very much for having me. Let me just um, screen share. And um, so... Right, um, it's, um, it's a difficult title, Vergangenheitsbewältigung. Thank you, Shruti, for commenting on this. Indeed, it is almost exclusively associated with the Holocaust. And um, I was born in 1971. So um, I was followed and haunted by the Holocaust uh, by growing up in Germany with such a horrible history where you really cannot identify with your past. This is the one thing. And um, it's a horror really about, you know, growing up and learning about this horrible history. But then also um, moving abroad, I've lived in many different countries, such as the United States, the UK, and studied at Oxford um, in Cambridge. And um, lived in Austria, spent some time in, um, in Jerusalem as well. Um, so um, I want to also uh, talk on this kind of entanglement of identities, which is not new, that already existed in the past. And um, I also wanted to use this term Vergangenheitsbewältigung and to disassociate it from the Holocaust context, because as someone who grew up with this kind of past, um, um, when I studied abroad, particularly in England, I was always confronted with this past. I was always, you know, Hitler came up, you know, at every dinner party, you know, don't mention the war, you know, a sandwich and so on, grab a sandwich, you know, faulty towers. And um, strangely, kind of colonialism didn't really come up. That's something that recently um, came up only. You see this very heavily on social media and um, you know, scholarship and research. And there was a little bit of schadenfreude to some extent that suddenly, yeah, you know, you also, you know, your past is catching up. But the thing is, um, it's the crooked timber of mankind, right? These horrible history of the Holocaust in my own country. Um, you know, you can't only dig up the dirt because it's everywhere. So to kind of idealize another country or to only portray the West, which I strongly see now, is also I find this a little bit ideological because we saw in Germany something which is like similar to anti-Semitism, it's the positive, uh, you know, version of it, philo-Semitism, to kind of uh, idealize um, a group which is equally kind of wrong. Now, uh, if you look at this image here that I've chosen, and um, I want to use this opportunity, and really, um, Ankit, I'm extremely grateful for this talk, because we know we've had, we've had many discussions about what kind of topics we could have, and it really gave me the opportunity to reflect. And I realized that um, when I came to India more than five years ago, I was looking for this German connection. So you see in brackets, it's my German connection, India, 
it's the German connection that I really wanted to reflect and make it personal. So it's not really quite strictly an academic talk, but it's a personal talk related to my research with historic buildings. Um, and hopefully um, by mentioning these particular cases that I found, this will be useful by finding a pattern. Now we have this uh, relationship with Germany on literature, philosophy and Sanskrit study. Now I would like to talk about the built environment. And now, if you look at this image there, um, this is an Udaipur, but it is really surprising if you look at this because it's extremely global. It's extremely cosmopolitan what you see there. You see tiles that look kind of Chinese that were probably delivered by the Dutch. And if you look carefully in the background, there's an because Farangi means foreigners. And there's a whole genre in art of Farangi art. And Farangi originally comes from the Persian and you know, Arabic um, re referring to the Franks, Franconia in Germany, really. So this is a great, I thought, you know, link to the talk we are having today. Also, if you think about porcelain, it is the most global art and object that you can think of from the production to the cobalt that was delivered. And this is another aspect of my talk, how much culture is entangled. And it's not a one way road from the West exporting something to the East or vice versa. It's many different narratives, many different connections. And I think we have to acknowledge this and don't only look at the kind of imposition from somewhere else because that is not how it was. So here you have this kind of, um, you know, the slide and you see that the whole kind of interior is shaped by the exotic. So and people were exoticizing each other and the tiles that were delivered from abroad are clearly in the context with this kind of Farangi art in the background because you can see both the tiles and the foreigners that were worthy of being de depicted as something exotic in this kind of uh, setup. And this is the prologue. Um, and um, I'll come back to this, but if you can just um, read this um, together with me. In general, analyses of the trans-regional cultural flows that mark the century, the eight. Let me just try and reach out to Professor. Professor, we, we keep losing you. Uh, perhaps it would be better if you keep your camera off to preserve yeah. bandwidth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. <sighs> this is the challenges. Hold on. Um, I just need to go back to Zoom and then I share again. Are you still able to see the presentation though? Yes, should I stop the screen share from uh, or? Uh, are you able to see the prologue? Yes. Okay. yes. Right. In general, analyses of the trans-regional cultural flows. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. That mark the century have privileged the reception of European forms and ideas, ignoring or marginalizing the multidirectionality of exchange, pre-existing or enhanced cultural flows that operated outside Euro European parameters, and the role of major imperial and sub-imperial centers such as Istanbul or Lucknow in the dissemination and mediation of Western European forms. Now, I just wanted to make sure because it was interrupted. Are you able to see the next slide? Historic houses? 
Yes, with historic yes. heritage as a career. So, as I said, um, it's a personal, and this is really, you know, thinking about the German connection in India based on my research, my work with uh, historic houses. This is where I grew up, and Lakshmi comes from Frankfurt. This is about um, 30, 40 kilometers from Frankfurt. It's a small village, and this is where the brothers Grimm um, grew up in this area. And they were born in Hanau. I went to school there, and this is the kind of landscape that they saw when they not only collected but invented the fairy tales. And um, so you see, the village is really shaped by three major buildings. The highest one is the church, and then you have the city gates around the village. And you know, similar to India, you have like a hill fort, you have these medieval fortresses, fortified architecture there. And um, here now, and this is also used for kind of fairy tale productions, really beautifully done. And um, I really love this landscape. And I was very much influenced by this um, historical landscape and all these um, beautiful historical buildings. And um, this is Hanau, um, where the Brothers Grimm uh, were born. And this is actually the oldest still existing merry-go-round in the world, um, which is really beautiful. And I've been in love with it ever since I saw it as a, as a child. So, and um, I mentioned this as well, because every two to three kilometers, uh, uh, there was a house of historic significance. And this was also two kilometers away from the village. And actually it was the workshop of the most famous or one of the most famous cabinet makers in the 18th century, David Röntgen. And you can see from these beautiful objects here, um, you know, the Germans love engineering clock works and there was actually an organ inside as well and um, although this was in the 18th century and you see it's really in the middle of nowhere this man he went all the way to St. Petersburg his furniture was sold to the Tsar and this is what we are talking about today it's the 18th century where people had many different kind of identities changed their names traveled far beyond what was considered possible in India was a way to have careers that otherwise would have not been possible because of social constraints. And I give you some examples of these. Now, I grew up as a teenager reading of Princess Remembers. So from um, you know early on, I, I was really very fascinated with Rajasthan. And uh, today we have this topic of blue and white, the presentation of blue. And this is um, in City Palace, Jaipur. And I think it's kind of inspired by porcelain. And there was this unique fascination with porcelain, not only in the West, but everywhere in the world, including in India. And um, yes, here you see again this, um, um, this place where I grew up. And recently, they just added this um, uh, little pavilion there um, just you know, uh, last year or so. Now, I would like to focus on things related to buildings, art history, and these are the kind of themes that I'm going um, to discuss today, certain books written in Germany by German art historians or travel writers on Indian palaces which have been very important for my work, but also a very unusual palace on the right, you can see there, built in the modernist style by Mutesius for the Maharaja of Indore in the 1930s became art historians usually working with Maharajas. So actually the princely states were very important for these emigres, uh, emigrants. And I don't think it has received any um, attention. So it's really important to mention this. And um, here you see the tomb of um, a German who left Germany in the 18th century and made his career in India, not um, as part of a colonial project. And I, this is what I want to highlight. There are many careers and um, engagements with India outside of the context of colonialism. And this is another um, focus of my talk. And they have left traces. Such encounters have, have left uh, traces in the form of marriages through other people, artwork, 
books and buildings. So these are, um, you know, some of these and um, uh, Oscar Reuter. So you have, you know, many different people. And I mentioned this, Shruti, um, in the comment before. How do we deal with macro and micro history, right? How do we deal with the common that we read? How representative is that, right? Oscar Reuter, he joined the Nazi party in 1933 to secure his career. And here on the other side, we have, um, you know, someone who, who fled and who went um, to India and uh, India saved his life. But again, um, you have also different attitudes towards Jewish immigrants. We only had about 5,000 uh, Jewish um, um, uh, immigrants. And um, some people were also against that, yeah, like Bose, for example, right? So we are basically having this uh, very fast kind of uh, race through uh, several centuries, the 18th century, which was the time of travel and opportunities. In the 19th century, I've come across a number of Germans who visited India and uh, had travel diaries or wrote books about India. Uh, sometimes German speaking, they came from Austria. And in the 20th century, then we have um, architects who built buildings in India. And these are kind of um, some of the people we are encountering today. All uh, Germans with many different um, life stories. So this is the, um, 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 the Udaipur theme that I started with. And it is really bizarre to find these kind of exotic tiles for the Indian. And exotic means different from what is expected. Yeah, so again, it works both way. And there was someone who, who, you know, who started looking into this in the 1950s, and I come back to this. And if you look at these images here, so you see two different types of tiles. They're all blue and white, so clearly, um, influenced by this whole idea of Chinese porcelain, and that has a long history in India, already during the Mughals, um, at many festivals, uh, important dinners, you had Chinese blue and white porcelain. Even in the Tukluk um, period, um, some of the uh, biggest um, discoveries of uh, Yunnan porcelain was discovered recently. So India has this history of export porcelain from China. Um, and here, if you look carefully, these are Delft tiles. Doesn't mean that they were produced in Delft. Many of them were produced in other places like Utrecht or um, Amsterdam, for example. And I think probably the iconography of these tiles, the meaning of these tiles were irrelevant because sometimes you have kind of um, Mary and Jesus, um, you know, biblical New Testament scenes. Uh, then you have just uh, totally different scenes, um, uh, secular scenes, and they're all kind of put together and uh, then you have some mirror elements. To me, this is just an example of um, the kind of exotic, the fascination of the blue and white, but the question remind, remains, how did they come there? And then on the other picture I showed you, um, this is um, the tiles were also used on the exterior and they were used specifically on what is called a gokada um, balcony. And these balconies often had also ceremonial functions where rulers would be seen. Um, so it's a relatively small area, maybe because they couldn't transport more tiles, but you see also whole ceilings, um, or because this was a prominent position and it was almost like a, a, a backdrop so that the ruler would be framed with these um, exclusive um, uh, tiles. Now the person who um, is probably the first person to think about how did that this was bizarre to come across these European tiles in a palace in Rajasthan. We're not talking about any kind of coastal areas where we had, you know, factories of the various East India companies, but this is in Rajasthan. And this was Hermann Goetz in the 1950s, one of these German Jewish um, emigrants who worked actually for the Maharaja of Bikanir. And um, in fact, not only this case of Udaipur, but he was um, he raised so many other important topics, and this was really the beginning of this kind of scholarship in uh, dealing with historic build buildings um, in India. And what we see here is um, a large painting on cloth, now at the Rijksmuseum, and uh, this shows actually the embassy of Ketela to the big. Um, Mughal emperor 
but this is in Udaipur. He stopped on his way. It was an overland journey from Surat to Lahore. And um, Ketela is an unusual name. His real name was actually Kessler. He was a German. He grew up in East Prussia near Danzig. And he was the son of a bookbinder, a very kind of humble background. Apparently, he uh, was mistreated by his uh, uh, master. He tried to poison him. Not such a glorious kind of history. Uh, he escaped, went to Amsterdam and went to India. And from there on, it was an ex a very successful career. And he was a very popular person and became ambassador. So he changed his name to Ketela. And this is one example of some uh, kind of different identities. He may have been, yeah, he was born in Germany, but uh, he spent more time abroad, you know, first in the Netherlands and then in India. And so we can see, you know, these um, images here with the red coats. And uh, if you look carefully in the middle, this kind of uh, Darba hall, you'll see some hats as well. And this is for the kind of higher ranking um, officials. So what, what can we tell from this um, painting? Well, first of all, this is like a kind of reportage. This is already something quite new. This is the time 1711, early 18th century. By then, um, Mughal art had an impact on uh, art in Rajasthan. So um, reportage was not something that was kind of common to Rajasthani art. You had kind of um, mythological uh, paintings, uh, some, something for book albums, but you didn't really have portraits as much in such a reportage. But we can also tell from this that this uh, visit was very important and was kind of enthusiastically embraced by people in uh, Udaipur. It was important enough to be portrait on a huge painting on cloth, which is also unusual because normally you have smaller kind of miniature um, um, artworks. And here um, you see another painting inspired by this visit. And this is kind of really interesting if you look at this, um, because you see these two Europeans, their faces are black, everybody else's face is white. So the kind of exotic people are the Europeans, <laughs> you know, not the Indians, because it's always, of course, uh, you know, depending on the uh, uh, on the perspective. Now, I've been studying documents and uh, journals relating to this visit, and uh, I can say it was carefully choreographed and both sides were extremely eager to please, to do the right thing, to choose the right present. Um, they had even kind of consultants, um, a Portuguese lady to inspect the presents first. And it was hugely expensive, something like 25 million um, uh, euros in today's um, money. It took two years. And because meeting the emperor uh, didn't mean that he would immediately make time, but he had to kind of bribe or give presents to other people and he had to wait around till he wanted to come. And it was extremely costly. So probably these tiles are the result of this visit um, in, in uh, Udaipur. Again, a German, but um, with a Dutch name and part of a Dutch embassy many different identities and huge opportunities for someone who wouldn't have had these kind of opportunities if he had stayed in dancing in um, uh, East Prussia where he came from. So, and this is another image which I wanted to show because these visits, this experience of meeting foreigners, Parangis, um, also resulted in um, ideas of the exotic, because clearly he is exoticized, right? He has, he is a Dutchman on a composite camel. If you look carefully, the camel consists of many creatures and animals put together. It's kind of bizarre. And he even has wings, right? And I wanted to show you this as an example of exoticizing the other works both ways. Again, it's not only um, the West as Edward Said, argued um, portraying the East um, in an exotic way, but you know, that happened everywhere. And here we see now a Western portrait of uh, Ketela 
<laughs> and one art historian said the kind of double chin and so on was kind of also well portrayed in the Indian version. And here you see the VOC factory in Surat. Uh, so we, we, we lost you once again. No, I think I can see people moving. Yeah, it says still my internet connection is unstable. So we are staying in the 18th century. This is Walter Reinhardt. Um, um, there is kind of, you know, uh, not so much evidence about when he was born. I've seen 1707, 1720, I've seen 1725 as well. He probably was born in Trier. Um, and he also changed his name. Um, he was called Summers when he uh, worked with the British um, and then uh, he uh, changed his name to Sombre uh, when he worked with the French. Um, probably this was more a, a nickname because people felt he was very somber and dark and earnest and later he was also referred to as the Butcher of Patna. So we also came from very, very humble backgrounds. Um, in, uh, in, in Germany, uh, but he touched many people, uh, whether <laughs> accidentally or inaccidentally, because he married um, this uh, lady on the right. She uh, became very famous, Begum Samru, and um, she was a Nord girl, and he um, put her into his harem and then uh, married her and she had the most extraordinary career. You can already see him dressed um, like a white Mughal, um, to use William Dalrymple's uh, term, and I think Fanny Parker's term originally. And this is not necessarily something we can use with post-colonial um, terms such as uh, cultural appropriation, because at the time, you know, there were also this kind of gift giving and exchange of robes, and it would have been considered extremely rude not to accept it. So it was almost um, kind of uh, respectful um, to wear Indian clothes rather than, um, you know, cultural appropriation. So here in 1763, he then worked with various local rulers. And that's also very important to mention because the encounter with Europeans is not only part of a colonial project. We have this personal story of people who didn't have opportunities in Germany because of their social limitations there and their background. And um, they just seized any opportunity. And so he worked for the um, Nawab of Bengal, whom you can see there. And um, he was, he was particularly notorious for just locking people in the building and killing them all. And I've seen different numbers from 45 to 100. And this is the only survivor here, William Fullerton, who was a surgeon and a personal friend of the Nawab. Um, and he had the kind of a personal at seven lives. He escaped any possible kind of attack, the black hole in Kolkata and also um, there. But um, it's always difficult to um, put and piece history together because it's often not a clear uh, narrative. So in 1769, for instance, he gave um, so much money to sponsor the reconstruction of the so-called Akbar's church in Agra. And this is in itself a very interesting project because Akbar um, already had um, um, a church built um, because he was very interested in um, different religions. And um, so how far did this uh, go? After his death, his um, wife converted to Catholicism. Again, it's difficult to say why she did what she did. Was it an opportunity for her? She was le using, um, le leading also a very hybrid lifestyle. She was still wearing the Muslim veil. She celebrated Christmas, but celebrated all the um, uh, Hindu festivals as well, including um, the Christian festivals. Um, um, was it a strategic move? Was it her personal conviction? We simply don't know. But it is extraordinary that in this small town, she created this um, uh, cultural center with a basilica and um, 
um, artwork and she became a patron of the arts and she became a military leader. This in itself is the most extraordinary story. And um, she built these buildings here and they are built in a neoclassical style, but uh, the, if you look at the interiors, um, it's kind of um, still a kind of blend between the East and the West. So if you look carefully, you see some Regency style chairs where the Europeans are sitting. This is very common at the time. As I said, there was a careful observation of um, each other's customs. So I've seen examples of where the Mughal emperor came to visit to the resident and they tried to create a peacock throne for him. And uh, when Europeans came to an Indian uh, residence, people provided chairs, for example. But you also see that she is sitting on a chair and other people close to her, some, including some Indians are sitting on the chair as well. So this is this kind of hybrid uh, lifestyle. Uh, this is the oldest existing photograph of her um, house. And um, this is what it looks like today. So unfortunately, it's in Chantni Chowk in Delhi, uh, looking uh, in not such a good um, shape here. And this is not so far from Jindal University in Narela, and um, uh, when she was a military leader. And her life inspired books, various novels, Sir Walter Scott as well, and even certain objects that you can buy today from a puzzle to the Samru um, uh, jar that you can see um, over there. So this one German person that came from nowhere in the 18th century, um, his life was, kind of showing ripples in many unexpected ways. So leaving the 18th century, I want to go to the 20th century. And this is the time of, uh, really I see two things here. Number one, the German Jewish emigrants who went to the former princely states and the built environments. Um, so please, just see that this is connected to my research, right? And what I've discovered, this is not a general kind of view of um, you know, the Germans and the connection with India. And you can also see, um, I forgot to mention this, uh, Shruti, as far as movies are concerned, at the same time, the topic of Maharaja is very popular in, in German movies and love stories around this and so on. And the second point is German architects in coming to India as an aspect of cosmopolitanism, internationalism from the side of increased travel from the side of the erstwhile royal families. So once was Professor, we uh, can't hear you again. Adventurous, normal people stayed behind and only the objects was their way of encountering the world outside of their horizon. Now we have mobility, we have Indians traveling, elites traveling, seeing things, studying abroad and encountering things and bringing this consciously back to India. Very important aspect because a lot of narratives only focus on the kind of imposition from the West. And this is a problem because it kind of doesn't acknowledge the agency that um, Indians had. And um, Devika Singh at uh, Cambridge University, she did some um, important research on this um, topic and she wrote, the leading position that exiles played in India as curators, museum directors, university professors and art critics from the 1930s to the 1960s is a little known aspect of art historiography that highlights significant transfers between Europe and India. Yes, absolutely right. And here there's a wonderful example that I came across um, in Jamnagar. This is the Jam Sapdana, um, the uh, Maharaja of um, uh, Jamnagar. And um, this was one of the kinder transporter 
uh, to India and no one wanted these children. And then he just said, okay, I'll adopt them all. He kind of adopted uh, uh, over 500 uh, children. And um, there's a really nice um, documentary about this little Poland in, in India, if you have the chance to see it. And this is uh, one of the uh, old forts in, in Jamnagar. You had other examples of these Jewish emigrants like um, the architect Otto Königsberger, who was associated with the royal family of Mysore. He was the chief architect in Mysore from 1939. Um, this book is still important, still in print, Manual of Tropical Housing and Building. And his main concerns and contributions were sustainable low-cost architecture, creating modern architecture based on vernacular Indian architecture, and architecture with a particular focus on the thermal aspects and especially um, the climate. Here you see pictures of him and some examples of the work he did um, in Bangalore, for example, ranging from a bus terminus in 1940 um, to a swimming pool. And this is um, a book that has that was very important for, for my work. Um, especially in, on Bikaner, this is um, Hermann Goetz. The other Jewish emigrant um, art historian was Ernst Korn Wiener, who worked with um, the royal family of Baroda. And you see here the um, kind of Baroda palace in the Indo-Saracenic style and Junaga fort in Bikaner. And I'm coming now to the other point, namely, um, German architects in India as a, a result of cosmopolitanism and travel of Indian elites in Europe. And here you see um, the Maharaja of Indore, uh, a famous painting uh, by Mauvel and Eckhart Mothesius. Uh, they met at Oxford and um, the Maharaja wanted a modern building. He was really intrigued by uh, listening um, to Mothesius. And although it is a kind of really, really extreme modern building, a very, very unusual palace, still many aspects of um, you know, uh, uh, finding uh, ways to cater for the climate are considered here. So uh, like for instance, shade and you know, um, ventilation, you can see here. I wanted to show you um, uh, one room um, from the interiors and um, it's really, um, Beautiful and um, luckily enough, I was able to find um, the original pieces here from that room that you can see here. Um, this is now used by the Indian government, um, the building. And this is a little, very short video um, to finish my talk, um, which we created for Palace Day, the Center for Historic Houses um, in collaboration with the uh, uh, Chateau de Versailles and the uh, European Network for Royal Residences. We introduced Palace Day to, um, uh, to India and over 90 palaces participated and the uh, Chateau de Versailles, they had started this. It's a really fantastic initiative. So. Actually, this was uh, supported also by the uh, German embassy, which is nice.
Thank you. Yes, so you've come to the end. <laughs> uh, well, let me thank you, Professor, for sharing your, your expert uh, work in this area and your long-standing relationship with, with, with this area, which does not get as much importance as, as it ought to. It's an important area, after all, heritage is an important area of study, and, and to embrace heritage is also an important aspect of becoming to uh, or coming to terms terms of the past and also the future uh, is a famous uh, Orwell quote also on, on this. But I will not I will not get into that because then we'll require another another discussion <laughs> or another seminar altogether. But let me just take this opportunity to thank our speakers for taking out time on a Saturday evening um, and also afternoon. Uh, uh, we're so we're so thankful to everyone. We're also thankful to our participants for joining this discussion. It's been a riveting experience. We look forward to future such discussions and collaborations with the center, society, and uh, uh, whatever the future possibly holds for us. Thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, last words, professors, and uh, uh, and uh, Lakshmi. Then then we can finally close. Thank you so much. It was a lovely <laughs> evening. Um, yes, uh, I cannot thank both uh, Lakshmi and Ista enough. I have learned so much from both of you. Uh, I obviously have a couple of questions and observations to make, but then we can always write to each other, I guess, right? Great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much um, to, you know, uh, Ankit for organizing this fantastic session. Um, I learned so much. Um, history was not my favorite subject in school, but you changed it completely today. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. I learned a lot today. And uh, Ankit, keep up the good work. And um, yeah, it was uh, wonderful to connect. And I look forward to keeping in touch and having more such sessions. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Thank you. <laughs>